don't forgive me for this trap shit. Sergeant Smack make it backflip. Telly Hank it with the action. With the vital speaking Spanish. Frank Matthews, how I vanish. Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut. Gold BBS is on a beamer. When Fat Cat was tearing queens up. Fall off the prop and not the re up. Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus. Uptown like I'm Baby Man. Just caught a touchdown. To a developing story and police are investigating what appears to be an escalating war against the notorious Ibrahim family. Bullet casings. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy, Papa Lot. Mob ties. We on our way to Australia with it. Sydney, to be more exact. King's Cross, to be extra more exact. Now, we're going to be talking about a specific family. Uh, this episode is going to be the Ibrahim family. And we're going to talk about uh, who the police deem to be the alleged head of the Ibrahim family. It's going to be a guy by the name of John Ibrahim. But before we can talk about that, we've got to talk a little bit about King's Cross. Now, um... If this real shit is touching anybody in Australia, Sydney, anywhere, I'm not even sure if we've been here yet, but y'all get in the comment box, let it be known. We fuck with G's everywhere. Matter of fact, any of y'all listening to this shit ever been to Australia or anything like that, y'all get in the comment box because the shit we talking about going to be crazy. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about a, a section um, of Australia in Sydney called King's Cross. And from 1988 to 1999, it was known as the Golden Mile. And from my understanding, it's going to be pretty much, i never been. So this is based on just me doing my research. But it's going to be like a, a mile long stretch of nightclubs and red night and red light districts. That's not too far from like the, the business hub of the city now if i'm wrong y'all correct me in the comment box but um yeah and in that particular mile how this particular family um come into play with that is john abraham he's going to be a nightclub owner who police allege that's a major a major organized crime figure and he pretty much was labeled the lifeblood of the drug industry in King's Cross. Um, I want to say they said that it was asked how much properties he owned. They said he owned pretty much everything except the McDonald's and the Coca-Cola sign. Um, and with it being called the Golden Mile, I know y'all know it wasn't uh, like no money being made. That shit, that shit was like probably like a gold nugget. And pretty much... From my understanding, that shit just led like to a bloodbath of for control. Um, now, the media, the Australian media, labeled John Ibrahim the Teflon, Teflon John, and the Teflon Man of King's Cross. Um, he's known as the King of the Cross. Uh, so he, he, he's definitely a big figure. Um, I said that. Um, the Golden Mile, it was named that from 1988 to 1999. It's 2019. And me doing my research just yesterday from when I was doing my research on him, I'm saying that they have articles popping up on him today talking about he's on the beach showing his knife wound. So he's like a, a celebrity gangster. If, if, Anybody know what that is? Uh, along the lines of John Gotti, it's like people are gangsters out in the open, and I can't even really the shit. The police can't allege shit on him, so I can't even really go in this talk about the shit he did. But his family, um, let's kind of let's just talk a little bit about them. He got a brother named Sam Ibrahim. I want to say he got a, a brother named Marty, and he got another brother named Michael. Um, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm right. He is John, Michael, Sam, and Marty. Um now Sam it's gonna be I wanna say that's his older brother, but um 
shit, I don't know them for real, for real, so I can't say 100%, but does have a brother named Sam Ibrahim, who was the first Lebanese Australian man to be allowed to join the Australian um, Outlaw Motorcycle Club. So in 1997, he was elected president of a Nomads, Midas, a Nomads Midas Motorcycle Club in Granville. Um, and pretty much he ran that in 2007. They splintered off and, and formed a... Uh, uh, they splintered off from the nomads due to like problems with upper management. Um, they started their own motorcycle club called the Notorious Gang, um, and it's it's alleged that they are the muscle for um, all the drug distribution that was going on in Kings Cross um, in 2004. Sam was charged with kneecapping two dudes in Newcastle. Um, he was also charged with cocaine distribution, and uh, during the late 1990s, um, in 2009, he was charged with kidnapping a teenage boy who he held um, in custody for four months. Um, I mean, he kidnapped a, uh, a teenage boy, and he was held in custody for four months. Um, I want to say that they said that the kid, he thought the kid was somebody who allegedly broke into his house. Um, now two of his, he have, uh, two other brothers that I spoke of, Michael and Fadi together in, um, May, 2011, along with another guy by the name of Rodney Phillips or, um, Goldie, which he was known Atkinson. Um, they was ordered to stand trial on a conspiracy to murder, um, John Marquise, um, in between July and September of 2009, they, I want to say they ended up, uh, beating that, beating that case, um, John, Daniel John Taylor, um, who was the son of, um, John Ibrahim and Melissa Taylor, he was committed in 2011 in order to stand trial on charges uh, of assault and, and to commit bodily harm to Melbourne tourists um, in August 2017. And this is the kicker. This is what brought this shit to mob ties because gangster shit been going on. But in August of 2017, 30 search warrants were executed in Australia as part of Operation Vendia. Um, in retaliation to two alleged major international drug syndicates operating in Australia, Michael and Fadi Ibrahim, um, they were arrested in Dubai, uh, the United Arab Emirates. Ten related arrests were made in Australia. Two others were made in New Zealand. John Ibrahim's girlfriend, uh, Sarah Budge, and his son, Daniel, were among those arrested. Um... His son was charged with possession of a federal, I mean, possession of a firearm. Um, and pretty much the haul that the police took from them was more than 1.8 tons of MDMA or ecstasy or molly, whatever y'all want to call it. 136 kilograms of cocaine, um, 15 kilograms of methamphetamine, and they also seized $5.5 million dollars. Um, in 1995, and uh, I want to say it's going to be uh, in 1995, it was the Wood Royal Commission that came out and it, and it um, pretty much identified John Ibrahim as the head of everything that's going on in King's Cross, and that led to a lot of the other stuff going on. Um, it's really hard for one one person to reign just over a, a game for that long, um, and this shit this shit so deep it got like I want to say they got a, a series called Underbelly or something like that where it talks about um, a book that was wrote about this subject where it talk about John Ibrahim just having affairs with police officer women and shit like that. So this shit go next level. He gonna be one of the biggest dons besides like John Gotti, um, Big Meech. And that matter of fact, y'all get in the comment box. Who was the biggest uh, in the United States? Who's the biggest 
dude in history to ever do this shit. Uh, it's your boy Papa. We're going to be back with some more real shit. Mob, mob. Mob Police ties. are investigating a drive-by shooting at a house in Sydney's northwest linked to the high-profile Ibrahim family. The sister of King's Cross identity, John Ibrahim, was the apparent target, with more than 20 bullets fired into her home last night. Former nomad bikey gang boss Sam Ibrahim rushed to his sister's aid after her home was peppered by bullets. More than 20 shots were fired into the house and at three cars. I see a bit shaken. Uh, concern apparently one of the projectiles uh, wasn't far from hitting one of the kids. Um, a pretty devastating situation. Armani Stilio and her 11 and 15 year old sons were woken up last night at 11.30 by the gunfire. Police say the family's extremely lucky. I can't comment on the motive at this point in time. All I can say is we do believe it was a targeted attack and at this point in time we're following a number of lines of inquiry. Dozens of police and detectives searched for clues today. Neighbours say they saw a silver hatchback driving off after the shooting. Police believe the bullets were fired from this car. In June last year, another Ibrahim brother, Fadi, was shot five times outside his Sydney home. Police have warned the family not to retaliate. She's never fallen foul of the law. Um, not, neither she nor her husband have any gang affili affiliations. So um, it's a bit of a surprise. Police are now appealing to any witnesses to come forward. Bridget Glanville, ABC News. To breaking news, news now, where new information has come to light about the victim of a shooting in Sydney's CBD overnight. Let's go straight to Nine's Gabrielle Boyle at the scene in Sydney. Gabby, what can you tell us? Well, we've learned in just the past couple of minutes that the 38-year-old man that was shot on Macquarie Street here in Sydney's CBD last night is 38-year-old Michael Ibrahim. Of course, he is the brother of John Ibrahim, famous Sydney nightclub identity. He is actually uh, fresh out of jail. He spent several years behind bars, a convicted killer. He was uh, incarcerated for manslaughter after a 2006 stabbing death here in Sydney and was released late last year. Now, he was taken from here at the scene on Macquarie Street where he sustained those gunshot wounds to Sydney Hospital just a few metres up the road. We understand he continues to be treated there. No doubt in the coming hours, as his condition improves, police will be at the hospital wanting to question him further over the circumstances Fadi surrounding Ibrahim, this the brother of King's Cross identity, John Ibrahim, has just been released from Silverwater Jail. Fadi Ibrahim has been in custody since he was arrested in Dubai as part of an alleged international National Drug and Tobacco Syndicate early last month. The 43-year-old will be placed under house arrest after coughing up a $2 million The wife boat. of former bikey boss Sam Ibrahim has given a rare insight into her life of fear. Karen Ibrahim held back tears as she gave evidence at her husband's kidnap case, which heard that if he's jailed, she said, their family would be vulnerable to attacks. Sam Ibrahim was convicted of aggravated kidnapping in September. Now John Ibrahim's oldest brother is fighting for his freedom in the face of a possible 25-year jail term. Hi Sam, how are you feeling today? Are you worried Sam? Are you confident? Standing by him today was his wife Karen. Holding back tears, she told the court in the lead up to the offence she was living in fear. In her bedroom and out the back of her former Greystains home, she had CCTV monitors which she says captured strange men staking out her house. On one occasion, she was so scared of being shot, she hit a panic button which sounded an alarm. So in 2009, when Sam Ibrahim kidnapped a 15-year-old boy he wrongly suspected of breaking into his home, his lawyers claim he was only trying to protect his family. Ma'am, what do you fear will happen if Sam's jailed? It was dark when the boy was grabbed, punched in the face, shoved in a car and driven here to this park where he was confronted by Sam Ibrahim and two other men. But when Sam Ibrahim took the boy to his wife, she told them they'd got the wrong person. Ibrahim let the boy go and gave him $100 to keep quiet. Instead, he went to the police. Psychologist Tim Watson Munro told the court Sam Ibrahim has had post-traumatic stress since being shot in January, adding the former bikey boss is now seeking a much quieter life. 
He'll find out if that includes jail next Wednesday. Ellie Southwood, to 10 News. Story and police are investigating what appears to be an escalating war against the notorious Ibrahim family. Bullet casings have been found on the footpath outside the eastern suburbs mansion of Sydney nightclub owner John Ibrahim. That comes less than 24 hours after a drive-by shooting in Sydney's west targeted a house next to his family's home. ABC reporter Philippa McDonald joins us now from Dover Heights. Philippa, what actually happened there? Well, we know that ammunition casings were found on the footpath outside John Ibrahim's Vaucluse mansion and that possibly last night shots were fired through his lounge room window of this clifftop home. Now, Stephen Alexander, who's John Ibrahim's lawyer, says that John Ibrahim is OK, but the criminals that did this are gutless and that Sydney's finest, meaning the police, should be able to solve this. However, just last night, as you mentioned, at Marylands, there was a drive-by shooting and the home right next door to John Ibrahim's mother was riddled with bullets. Well, there's been a string of these incidents, as you mentioned, more than, than the ones you've just mentioned. To what extent is this an escalation of violence against the Ibrahim family? Juanita, this is definitely an escalation and there's been a huge police presence here at Vaucluse scouring this crime scene. This has got to be seen in the context of five shootings related to the Ibrahim family just this year. At the beginning of the year, John Ibrahim's brother Sam Ibrahim was shot in the legs. Two years ago, another brother, Fadi Ibrahim, was shot five times as he sat in his Lamborghini outside his home. But this time, it's different. This is targeting the head of the Ibrahim family, John Ibrahim, known as the King of King's Cross, a man who's a big-time businessman with an ownership of something like 20 nightclubs in Sydney. Philippa MacDonald at Dover Heights. Thank you. They are a made-for-television cast of characters. The brutal older brother, Sam Ibrahim. Michael, ambitious, reckless and headstrong. The flamboyant Fadi. And Teflon John Ibrahim, Mr Legit. I think uh, Teflon John is the best description of him. He's very rat cunning and smart. He took a course that was somewhat different to the others. He promoted himself as a businessman. Fadi was more of a flamboyant character. A lot of people called him a ladies' man. Do you think that's correct? That, that, that's correct. Michael was more the criminal from the outset. Sam, he certainly had the reputation of being effectively a standover man. The other point, I think, which is significant is that the, the four Ibrahim brothers have all been shot at some stage or another. That's true, yeah. And to be shot's a pretty significant issue. From humble beginnings, they've never been far from the headlines. And 12 days ago, they were making them again. Across Sydney and around the world, one of the biggest police operations ever, busting open a conspiracy to import close to a billion dollars in drugs. This was a very um, st over the top, if you like, planned importation. I should say it's not by it's by far from the biggest importation we've ever heard of in the history of drug importations. But at the same time it ranked up there amongst the big ones. Michael and Fadi Ibrahim were arrested as they stepped off a luxury cruiser in Dubai, alleged to be key figures in the international syndicate. Perhaps not surprisingly, there was one notable exception to the lineup of accused. The self-proclaimed King of the Cross, John Ibrahim, the man often described as the head of the family. He's a character, um, smart ass, thinks he's um, God gift to women, you know how he is, playboy, uh, smart bloke come to the cross when he was about 16, 17, and his goal was to take over the, the, the whole street and earn as many nightclubs he, he can possibly have. His goal was to take the entire cross over? Yeah, well, he did. Took most of it. 
Except for McDonald's and the Coca-Cola sign he didn't take. Does John enjoy the notoriety? Loves it. Loves the attention, mate. For 30 years, Tony the Inspector Akmar has been one of John Ibrahim's closest friends and advisors. He's never spoken about their relationship until now. Is he a businessman or a gangster? A businessman or a gangster? Man, why don't you ask him that question? These days, John describes himself as a businessman. His multi-million dollar empire includes much of this street right in the heart of the cross. He's often seen at the cafes and bars here, as are his bodyguards, who are never far away. John is an author and a Sydney celebrity, sought out by the successful, the famous and the wannabes. When I first met John, I'd heard the same things as everyone else had. I'd read the same things. I thought the same things as everyone else did. But he was just a very nice, genuine, like open-hearted, decent guy, polite to me. And the first time I met him, I thought, oh, wow, he wasn't what I expected at all. I was expecting, I'd know what I was expecting, some Tony Soprano sort of a vibe is what I was expecting. But that wasn't what I got. Happy, smiling, good sense of humour. And then I met him a few more times because I, I was introduced to him by Jeff Fennick, who was a mate of mine. And I thought, you know, that, that John's a nice guy. The devil inside, the devil Certainly, John Ibrahim has always sold himself as the nice guy of the family. The devil inside, every single one of us, the devil Armed with good looks, charisma and supreme confidence, he rose to power on the Golden Mile. Nah. His story was portrayed in the TV series Underbelly. I just run a business. You start wars, finish it yourself, mate. It was like a zoo back then, mate. I'm going to be honest with you. It was like a circus. It was fun. The TV drama also featured the story of Kim Hollingsworth, a former prostitute turned trainee cop. It was, it was great fun. It was great fun down the cross back then. The strip was buzzing. The spruikers were out the front. There were nightclubs and there were strip joints. Everyone was young, beautiful, having fun. And you were just there to have fun. It was great. It wasn't all as fun as you're portraying. No, <laughs> well, no, the violence was, I mean, it was very violent. There's a lot, a lot of blood. I walked into the love machine one day and the walls were splattered with blood. Kim met the young John Ibrahim while working at the Love Machine strip joint in the halcyon days of King's Cross. What was John Ibrahim like in those days? I mean, I know he was young, but he was already pretty ambitious. Oh, absolutely, yeah. He's like an entrepreneur. I think he, he, that was born into him, you know. He always wanted things and he wanted to be successful. It's a long way from the red lights of the Golden Mile to where it all began. Sydney's working-class Marylands. The son of Lebanese migrants, John Ibrahim, like his brothers, stood out in the largely Anglo-Saxon neighbourhood. Best childhood ever. Growing up in Marylands at the time and being the only Lebanese in the area made us exotic, not annoying like today. How important is family to John Ibrahim? It would be at the top of his list, I think. It would be at the top of his list. Above money? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Charlie Staunton was a corrupt former Sydney cop, a convicted international drug smuggler and, for a time, a close friend of the Ibrahims. He even travelled to Lebanon with John. Charlie's now living in exile in London. So what do you think it was about John's character, about John as a person that drew you to him? He's, he's charming. He's, he's, you know, he's charming. He's, um, he's a man's man. One of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. Charlie met the Ibrahims while he was still a cop. In those days, older brother Sam was working for King's Cross crime boss, Louis Bayer, running security. A fresh-faced John wanted in. Well, jo John was, he, he was only a young fella at the time. He, he was a young, fierce, a fierce young, fierce young man he was. What made him fierce? Well, they could fight. Both him and Sam, they could both fight. Sam was wild. John was, John was the quieter one. I was just a shit kicker running around after them. Um, 
they were doing all, and standover is such a nasty word. Whatever was illegal back then is legal now. They were collecting from the illegal gambling clubs and um, all the illegal brothels and strip clubs or whatever was going on at the time. I was just a shit kicker back then, but it was a very fast education. He was driven and he wanted uh, nightclubs, he wanted to be successful, um, and that was the way to do it in King's Cross. Do you think John's a smart guy? I think he's very intelligent. I think he's, um, he's shown that throughout the years because most people from back in that era in King's Cross are dead. John's big break in the cross came in the early 90s while working as a doorman for Louis Bayer. He intervened in a fight between another doorman and a chef and was stabbed in the stomach, the massive scar he proudly displays as a badge of honour. Stabbing was very serious. I had my shirt tucked in and, like, um, my stomach had actually poured out and I could sort of see pulsating through my shirt. John was dead for a time. Yeah, he was, he was in a bad way. He was in a critical condition, fighting for his life. And it was a big hit, mate. He copped it right here. He copped a big hit right here and just opened his stomach. It was hanging out, honestly. No word of a lie. So John got compensation? He did, yeah. He How did. much? I think he got paid 50 grand for that. And then that's when he made his move. He um, jumped on the opportunity. He saw the tunnel. And he, he always had his eye for the tunnel. You can see it in him. The tunnel nightclub in the heart of King's Cross was a cash cow. It was the first of some 40 clubs John Ibrahim would ultimately own or control over the next three decades. Once I got there, I just, I'm a quick learner and I just went with the flow. Mm. It was all, everyone in the cross seemed to be on the same wavelength, so to speak. Um, and it only went haywire when the drugs hit King's Cross, which was 91, 92, 93. And that just crashed over King's Cross like a tidal wave. It ruined everything. The cops then started freelancing for drug dealers, where before it was only just a normal run of the mill, illegal gambling clubs, strip clubs and the brothels. So, uh, Tony, this is, I guess, in many ways, the spot where it all began. Yeah, mate, well, brings back memories here. Plenty of memories? Yeah. You guys are sort of, you know, lining the streets here, and the cops are keeping an eye on you from up there. Well, they were spying on us. You can see them spying on us with binoculars and that, even from the front. And really? The, yeah, honestly. He went from being around about 20 buying into or buying one nightclub to owning a, to having an ownership of or a share, major share in at least 20 nightclubs. And it's grown since then. And that was in a relatively short time. Now, for him to have accumulated that money, there was a lot of money about. Former New South Wales Assistant Commissioner Clive Small was there as the Ibrahims established themselves on the Golden Mile. How did the Ibrahims get themselves into a position where they effectively were able to run their competitors out of the cross? I mean, that, that, that was a big job. What you had was John Ibrahim bought into the one nightclub. He aligned himself with other active members and more senior people who were running around the cross. That allowed him to progress. But by the time he bought or had a significant interest, in some 20-odd nightclubs at the cross had put him in a pretty powerful position. Sam was the muscle. Well, Sam was always the muscle. And, and John was the brains, making money and investing it and buying into in the clubs. Not like us, we go down the tab and blow our money on horses and cards and Sam will be off his head all day and night playing poker machines and wasting his money and, and time, you know, but he was, the, he, was the, he was the saver. He was very good with his money. While John was a canny businessman branching out into real estate and security work, his profile and wealth made him a target and earned him a nickname that stuck. He hates the name Teflon John, doesn't he? No, he doesn't like that word, Teflon. Yeah, you're right. Why? Because they're, make, they're making out that he's some underworld figure who's put contracts out on people and, and hurt people, nah. 
Is he an underworld figure? Nah. You come near his family and his, and, his, and his bread and butter, he's gonna take you on. You don't wanna call him a criminal. He calls himself Mr. Legit. Where's the truth? Is it somewhere in between? I'm not gonna say he's fully legit because I'll, be, I'll look like an idiot. You know what I mean? He's not fully legit. No one's fully legit. Coming up, Mr. Teflon's brother, the bikey boss. He didn't take any nonsense and his mates in high places. I've never seen anything ever dodgy. He's a man of his word. John Ibrahim was the new king of the cross, running nightclubs and security along the Golden Mile. This was the heyday of the famed Sydney nightclub strip. Sex and drugs were plentiful. I saw lots of drugs in prostitution, and I mean, mounds of cocaine, mountains of cocaine. It was just incredible. There was a lot of heroin around, speed was big then. That, that's never been the way I've made my money. I was lucky enough to have come in the mix at a good age where I learned how to make money out of the alcohol industry. I was a licensee at 19. I was well on my way of becoming a good businessman before drugs had even were seen on the streets of King's Cross or Oxford Street. In its heyday, just how wild was it? Best place in the world. Crazy. You miss it. It's mad. Hectic. Lights packed. You name it, mate, they're all there. John was well on his way to building his business empire, now estimated to be worth some $50 million, much of it prime real estate investments. Unlike previous kings of the cross, John didn't stay in the shadows. He said, there's a lot of attention being given to the cross. What I need to do is promote myself as an honest businessman he used the fact that he was uh, running something like 20 nightclubs as an example of his investments and legitimacy and all of that sort of thing, uh, and went to the newspapers at times, giving them little stories and um, promoting himself in some positive fashion. John's brothers were attracting their fair share of attention too. None more so than former Nomad's bikey boss, Sam. He's been charged and jailed for threatening to kill a business associate and intimidating police. Sam was also the target of a drive-by shooting outside his mother's home. There were a lot of people that were afraid of Sam Ibrahim. Yes, yes. What was his reputation? Um, he was a bad guy and um, he, I mean, he didn't take any nonsense and he was a survivor of the cross, and that, that was the way it was. It was, when they say it's a jungle, it was a jungle. And you, you had to be like that to survive. And I mean, Sam may have, you know, tipped the balance <laughs> a little bit and taken it further, but um, that was how guys established their reputation up there, and that's how they rose through the hierarchy. But it wasn't just Sam running foul of the law. Three years ago, sister Jazz Dior was arrested for weapons dealing along with Sam. She pleaded guilty but avoided jail. He's currently in prison awaiting sentencing. In 2009, this haul of $3 million cash sealed in plastic bags was found by police in the ceiling of Jazz's house. This police video has never been broadcast before. I don't think uh, there'd be very many families, if any, uh, that would have $3 million stashed in the roof of the house. Jazz claimed she had no idea how it got there and walked free. Where on earth would she no get idea. $3 million? Who knows? Someone knows. Well, if we knew about it, let me tell you something. I promise, to go, if John knew about it, Sam knew about it, anyone knew about it, we would have gone and taken it out of the roof. Well, who put it there, the Tooth Fairy? Oh, I, I don't know. Then there was Fadi Ibrahim. Fadi, you a gangster? 
Well, Fadi appeared to be the most flamboyant and girl chasing of the brothers. Well, he, Fadi just worries about his teeth and his hairstyle because he's always wearing a suit. Fadi first grabbed headlines in 2009 when he was shot five times in his Lamborghini on Sydney's affluent North Shore. That caused a lot of angst within the Ibrahim family. There was a lot of retaliation and threats being made, but it was never clear who was being threatened or who was the shooter. Fadi and the youngest Ibrahim, Michael, were later accused of plotting to kill an underworld rival in retaliation for the attack, but walked free. Michael seemed to have been the most reckless and in, in, in one sense, the most fearsome. Michael Ibrahim may have been late to the crime scene, but he made up for lost time. He served six years for manslaughter and soon after his release was the victim of a drive-by shooting. When you actually look at the history of the four brothers, what I think is significant is that the four of them have at different stages of their careers been shot and wounded. That's not an insignificant thing to be shot, is it? It's not insignificant and you can't say it happened by chance. Without doubt, the most visible and infamous of all the brothers is John Hussam Ibrahim, Teflon John, or as he likes to call himself, Mr. Legit. Despite all the innuendo, he's never been convicted of a serious crime. Forget the te speculation. I think I've been charged with a lot of things, but really you should look at the charges that were actually laid. They were never designed to actually go any further than the court. Once the court heard them, they'd all get dismissed. You won't like me for this, but let's get to the heart of it. There's a staggering amount of allegations out there. Correct. And yet we're all asked to believe that John just has no idea? Not on, not, not, not on everything what his, his, his other siblings do, mate. These days, John Ibrahim claims he's walked away from the nightclub scene. He's now an investor, seemingly content to hang out with celebs and socialites. I've never seen anything ever dodgy. And, and believe me, the first year I, I looked, I had my eyes open like, like you know, like a, like a hungry cat looking for, oh, I wonder if something dodgy is going on. Nothing. The guy, the guy's, he's a hard worker. He's, he's, he's a beautiful person to his friends. Outspoken Sydney radio host, Kyle Sanderlands. Hello. I love you, mate. Again with this, what's with you? is one of many gushing mates keen to attest to John Ibrahim's good character. They even share holidays together, like this recent jaunt to the Mediterranean, all captured by the paparazzi. John will be the first person to ring me up and say, what have you done? You shot your big fat mouth off. You're all over the newspaper or you're all over the TV and... Uh, but says, don't worry, mate, you know, like, you know, I know what you like, people don't know what you like and... That's what real friendship is. Coming up, John Ibrahim polishes his image. And then, the bombshell. Have we seen the fall of the House of Ibrahim? Well, put it this way, they've got, they've got a few headaches. For three decades, Sydney's notorious Ibrahim family has never strayed far from the police radar. But detectives only dreamed of putting the family out of business for good. How many task forces have been assembled over the years to, to try and track or bring down the Ibrahims? There's been five or six that I'm generally aware of, but it's very hard to say because a number of task forces have been conducted in secrecy and uh, we're never told about them. But clearly they haven't been a success because um, we haven't read about them. I think there'd be a large degree of frustration amongst a number of police, federal and state. Meanwhile, John Ibrahim, Mr. Legit, was raking in a fortune, buying up big in real estate and even sharing investment advice with his wealthy mates. You know, it was John that said, you know, she should invest some of this money 
and have some other avenues of income, use that money to, you know, create more wealth. And, you know, he, he's a businessman. He, he taught me, and I'm, I'm not. I'm the, I'm the last person to come to for business advice because I'd spend it all on junk. Businessman John was also busy working on his carefully crafted public image, even campaigning against drunken violence. If you're a real friend, you step in and you stop your friend from making an idiot of himself, getting hurt or worse, hurting someone else. Don't be a dickhead. The recent release of John's autobiography brought him into the public spotlight again as he sold the myth of the street smart migrant made good. Good afternoon. Well, I finally get an interview with you. It's taken a number of years. I had to retire first. Here was the kinder, gentler John speaking about his son Daniel's career in the army. I am very proud that he served his country. He got it into his head to at least serve once, and he did it. And um, whatever he does now is all a bonus. And not to be forgotten, the Ibrahim boy's long-suffering mum whose home was raided for a second time last week. Go, go, go! Please, sir, please. A gun was seized. It's very unfortunate, the trouble we've brought to a doorstep uh, over the years, and it's very... <laughs> um, there's not enough words to describe it, though. Does she get angry at you? Has your mum said no. to you, why do you do this to me, why...? No, she just thinks we're very unlucky. And 12 days ago, luck for two of John's brothers, Michael and Fadi, was about to run out again. For almost a year, state and federal police in Australia had been working with counterparts in the Netherlands and Dubai on an elaborate takedown that was called Operation Vader. Their targets were prominent underworld identities involved in a billion dollar importation scheme. Last November, here at this luxury Sydney hotel, police claim Michael Ibrahim met with a man now codenamed Male Witness One. Police say he made Michael an offer he simply couldn't refuse. Michael reportedly stood to make $50 million out of the scheme. He could retire for good. He allegedly set about recruiting others to share in the spoils, among them brother Fadi, who police say mortgaged his eastern suburbs mansion for a million dollars to help fund the deal. The drugs and tobacco originated in Europe. They were to be shipped out of the Netherlands, but police there were one step ahead. So the Dutch police is following these guys for, I think, few months or maybe half a year and uh, well the tactic is always not to seize them immediately but to follow them to look at them to wire their phones to to see how big they are what they are doing do we know exactly where they were found where they were seized it was uh, seized before it left the country as far as Michael and Fadi Ibrahim knew, the massive shipments were on their way to Australia. The brothers had flown to Dubai to meet other members of the syndicate. What exactly is the Dubai connection here, Mick? The criminals go to Dubai and they meet each other in fancy restaurants, fancy clubs, fancy boats, and it's a perfect spot to, to do trading. As Michael and Fadi were celebrating on a luxury $45,000 a day cruiser in Dubai, police swooped in synchronised raids in three countries. Among those arrested, the two brothers, Michael and Fadi. John, come on, he has, what, no idea of the criminality of his own family. No, because I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why, because they don't tell him. They don't tell him anything because he goes off at them. Tony, look me I'm in the eye. I'm being serious. In Sydney, John Ibrahim's luxury Dover Heights home was raided. And his girlfriend, Sarah Budge, was arrested for possession of a firearm 
a baby Glock pistol. Why were you in possession of a gun, Sarah? John's son, Daniel, was also arrested, accused of handing over a bag containing more than $2 million to finance the importation of illegal cigarettes. The case against him is extremely weak. He's looking forward to clearing his name. He will certainly be defending these charges, and we look forward to the early dismissal of this charge. John was not arrested. Soon after the raid, he spoke with his close friend, Tony Akmar. I did speak to him, and uh, he was very, very upset, very sad. Um, he was very upset that his son got caught up in that, because he, 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 I remember he'd always try to bring his son up in a, in a good way, um, and that's the honest truth. I'm not going to sit here and make him look, you know what I mean? He, he didn't want his son to be like his father and grow up like his uncles. He's a shattered man when it, what, what happened last week. Very shattered, very upset. John Ibrahim has kept a low profile since the arrest of his son, Daniel, girlfriend, Sarah Budge, and brothers, Michael and Fadi. His book is a bestseller, and he's actively looking for new opportunities. I've been retired for three years. I'm ready for a new um, career. I just don't know why yet. Have we seen the fall of the House of Ibrahim? Well, put it this way, they've got, they've got a few headaches 